So basically, where we are at is the. Let me grab the ggplot plot. So this whole chapter makes a very big deal about how um, the internals are actually divided into two steps. The first step is actually just like a whole lot of data wrangling. So the first step is grabbing like the raw data that the user provides to ggplot internals, like through the code. So like inside the data argument of the ggplot function or individually the data argument of different layers. Um, the internals collects that data that the user gives you and then it transforms the data such that you get the kind of information that you need to draw the actual uh, plots. And I should have put up my... Uh, I gave a talk um, at the user conference on um, ggplot internals. Um, and I guess I'll just give you like the, the, the brief, like three minute intro to internals that I did before I introduced my package. Um, but basically uh, the idea is uh, the, the internals are kind of what's hidden from user facing functions. Um, and the user facing functions are the things that we're familiar with. Like, you know, we, we grab our data set that includes the kind of variables or columns that we want to plot. Um, and then we write some short ggplot code, like let's say g on box plot to get like a box plot figure. Um, but then like you don't, you don't really specify the, the kinds of information that's actually needed to draw the individual graphical elements of the plot. Like you don't give it information about the median or you don't give it information about outliers, how far the whiskers um, extend. You also don't provide it as the user information about things like what is the you know shape of the box plot that ggplot is supposed to draw. You're making all these assumptions about like g on box plot draws box plots, but like one, what kind of information goes into drawing box plots, and then two, what what is what what are box plots made of? It's made up of you know like a uh, rectangle uh, in the middle. That's like the body, right? And then you have this crossbar so that's like a horizontal segment very thick it represents the median you have the whiskers which are these vertical two segments that extend from the boxes and then you have outliers which are points you don't need to make that explicit as the user which is the nice thing about ggplot um, it makes it very user friendly but then you do have to specify it at some point for these things to be drawn and that's what the internals does so the the first step in the internals the build step uh, which is what I covered like a month ago, um, is the step where you compute the necessary summary statistics that's needed to draw the individual graphical elements. And then the graphical elements are actually drawn after you compute the summary statistics. So this is kind of the, the example I used. So in the internals, you need to do like two steps. Um, the book calls it like, the bill step and G table step, because these are actually like steps that are defined by the code. There's a ggplot build function and then a ggplot G table function that follows from the ggplot build function. But I really like to think of it more in terms of the distinction between stat and geom, because that's also how the build and G table steps are kind of separated. So the stat is like, you know, the, the step where you compute these summary statistics that um, represent the box plots. You don't give ggplot that, you just give it, you know, the, the data to summarize over, like the, the y aesthetic in this case. Um, and then ggplot has to internally calculate some properties of that distribution. That's what happens in the stat stage, which is also what happens in the build stage. And then the geom stage is kind of takes those summary statistics that are internally computed and then draw things with it. Um, and in that process, it needs to allocate you know, certain parts of the summary statistics to specific things that it draws. So like the information about the quartiles are for drawing boxes, like the geom determines that. Uh, but what determines the fact that you compute quartiles, that's the stat. So that's kind of the division of labor that's happening between the stat and the geom. And then in the code, this process happens inside of the build step, which is done by the ggplot build function and the gtable step, which is done by the ggplot gtable function. Um, and just so I refresh your memory on this, the, the kind of 
all the things that need to happen for you to get the ggplot figure can essentially boil down to just these like you know five lines of code um and the actual actual function that that does this is not that long uh, but basically you call ggplot build on the ggplot object first and then you grab that output and then pass it to ggplot g table and then you initiate like a new canvas for drawing this is a grid function grid new page and then you actually draw the output of the g table function and that's the plot so it's really just the build step and the g table step that does like 99.9% of the work and then the actual print function the print method for ggplot you know does some other things like um like if you know the last plot function, it's like a cache that stores the last plot that's been printed to the console. Like it does some some of those you know things that I talked about last time. But yeah, but like we're now at this G table step where we have information. Um, we have these like transformed uh, data that we derived from the input data, which was I don't remember what the actual data was. Was it MPG? Yeah. So the MPG data is like you know data about cars, cars are rows, and you have a bunch of columns that um, are variables describing the cars. Like I don't actually know what these are, but you know it has this. This is like drive, like four wheel drive, front wheel, rear, rear wheel, highway miles per hour, I guess, um, or miles per gallon. But yeah. Um, anyways, we're at the step where like we. Finish ggplot build. One of the outputs of ggplot build is the transform data associated with each layer. So we talked about how each layer has a stat and a geom, and they can have different stats and different geoms, which is why if you look at the underlying data representing each layer that's been transformed internally, the data for the first layer, which I think is the geom point layer, um, looks different from the data representing the second layer, which is the geom smooth layer because different stats transform these objects. For the geom point, it's stat identity because you're just transforming the X and Y coordinates faithfully and representing it with a dot. Um, but then for geom smooth, you're fitting a line inside the stat ggproto, the stat method, the stat step fits a linear model for you because I think I specified LM here, fits a linear model for you according to the formula you specify. Um, and then it gives you a bunch of points that are predicted from that line. And then using those points, you actually draw a line. You connect the dots. That's how you get the, the line. And then the confidence band is just you know y min and y max, and then drawing it with like geom ribbon actually. Um, so so geom smooth is actually like one call to geom line and another call to geom ribbon. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of the data that we need for the smooth layer. This is the data that we need for the point layer. And we have that. Um, and this is where we start. So um, again, this is the actual function that calls like ggplot build and ggplot g table. This is what the function that's called under the hood when you just print a ggplot object to the console and get back a plot. It's actually this whole thing running in the like behind the scenes for you. So here's like the step where it does ggplot build. And then here's the step where it grabs the output from ggplot build and then passes it to ggplot g table. Um, and then here's the step where, you know, you you initiate a, a drawing canvas and then you draw the GT for, uh, yeah. And then some other stuff like support for printing Braille, um, Braille R, which I think is, I'm, I think this just like, yeah, prints some kind of like metadata that you know, people hard of hearing or or hard of seeing, so can can still. Um, look at to examine what's going on with that. Um, okay, so the first thing that happens inside the ggplot g table step uh, in the book, uh, like uh, the book likes to say that the first thing is um, that each layer is converted to a list of graphical objects. So this is the, the step of going from these kinds of data sets to actual graphical elements. So these are transformed into actual points and all of these are transformed into you know, smooth lines with a confidence band. Um, and this happens um, in this in this step. I actually didn't print the whole thing out here, but this this ggplot gtable function um, is very big. 
And I think in the ggplot source code, it's like probably around like 300 lines long. Um, so it's a very, very big function that looks like this, uh, which is super overwhelming, but actually we'll see that a lot of the important stuff happens in like the first, like maybe like 10, 20 lines of code and the rest is like small, like fiddling things with if else statements. But yeah, so the first thing that happens is um, you transform that data into actual graphical elements. Um, and this happens in step six. So this is a step where internally it defines a variable called geom grobs. So grob stands for graphical objects. So it's the graphical objects that are the product of the geom step. So again, the geom step is the part where you grab the computer summary statistics, you grab the transformed data, and then you draw things. Um, so these are the stuff that is drawn for each layer. Um, if we grab what this internal variable looks like when it's defined, this geom grobs variable, um, this is another function from ggtrace that does this. Um, you'll see that it's the list of lists. It's like a nested list um, such that each element of the like top level list is a layer. And then the, the nested elements are um, panel. So it's like this whole thing represents everything that's drawn for the point layer. And this is what's drawn for the first panel of the points layer. And this is what's drawn for the second panel of the points layer. Uh, and you can actually inspect this outside of the G table pipeline using layer grob function, which is similar to the layer data function that gives you the, the output of the um, ggplot build stage. But this is not super relevant. But what it is, what it is kind of interesting is that once you, when you, when you, after you grab this like geom grobs variable that's internally calculated, that's like a list of um, list of graphical objects that represent each layer, what each layer draws for each facet. Uh, we can like you know subset it. So this is um, the, the the graphical element that the point geom our first layer draws for the first facet, and it looks something like this, which is exactly the same as if we go up here and saw the points layer up here. So it's a list of these kinds of graphical elements. So you're going to get layer times facet amount of these elements um, at this by this step. And then the next important step is where plot table variable is defined. So this is the stage at which the ggplot starts looking like a ggplot. So once you have um, the graphical representation for each layer, then the next step is to kind of embed it in like the skeletal like ggplot looking structure with like the axes and facet strips, um, you know, and like all that stuff. So when the, the step where this plot table uh, variable is defined is step eight. And it's another one of G table. So this is the, the the first time that the G, the G table comes to life and the output of the G table step is also again like the name suggests a G table, but this is like you know when it where the journey starts, so you have this plot table variable and in fact a lot of the code inside ggplot G table is just assigning things um, back to the plot table object like here. Right, so it's again just like updating this plot table variable, but the plot table variable starts here and when it starts, it looks like this, which is already pretty close to the final ggplot that we get. Um, but here we have the um, the geoms, the, the graphical objects that are drawn for each layer actually being represented and they're, you know, appropriately positioned um, and slotted inside the space that's reserved for the facets. Um, and you also get facet strips and access tick marks, access labels, access titles, and all that stuff. Except you're still missing like the legend and the plot margins uh, because this plot has no margins um, and the title, subtitle, you know, captions and tags and all that. Um, but yeah, so that's like the first time where the the G table um, is defined. Um, I have some smaller things here that you can read on your own because it's kind of a lot of code um but here's like kind of a sneak peek of what happens like after this step because there 
actually isn't like a whole lot of important steps. I think what happens after this step, this happens in the first eight lines of code um, in the in the source code for the ggplot gtable function. After this, like a lot of things that happen are like trivial. Um, and this is what I mean. This is a uh, I made a GIF of everything that happens um, to the plot table variable. Like every time the plot table object changes, I recorded that change and then like just mushed it into a GIF. Um, and you'll see that like this starts around like step eight, I guess, or nine where it's defined. And then you get the legend. And then after that, it's just making space for different labels and then printing those labels. Um, and it's a little bit better um, if we actually add in like subtitles, captions, and tags. You'll see like when different elements pop up um, in the plot throughout the course of the ggplot gtable step. But you can see like by step 16, like pretty much everything that you need that's like important has happened, which is you know the the, the data and the fastest and layout and the legend um, happens by step 16. After that, it's just you know small little tweaks, printing out different labels. Um, yeah, so so pretty trivial, but does take up like you know 200, 300 lines of the source code, which is very overwhelming. Um, but this is basically the gtable step summarized. Um, but of course, one of the important steps that happened within um, from step, I guess like nine to fifty three, which is the last last thing that's evaluated inside the function, um, is adding guides. Um, and so the guys first come to life when the legend box variable is defined internally inside ggplot gtable, and that happens at step 11. Um, and so we can inspect what this looks like. This is called, this is created with this function called build guys. It only exists internally. Um, but once it is defined, we can look at what it looks like, and it's just like the legend, um, except it also undergoes a couple more uh, changes after it's first defined. So depending on whether depending on like where you put the legend in the plot and like how you resize the legend and what kind of theme you give it, it might look different from step 11 to I think step 15, which is when it eventually gets like ultimately finally gets added to the plot table, um, which is kind of the, the, the object that we're, we're updating throughout the course of the ggplot gtable function and was first created back in like step six. Um, and so step 15 is where, you know, the um, legend box variable is added to the plot table um, and added in different places depending on what position um, you place the legend box in. So I think this is actually just a legend dot position argument of theme that ggplot internally grabs and then and then saves it to this variable called position. If you put it in the left, then you 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 put it on. You know, like the 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 these like gtable functions basically, you know, shuffle things around and add grabs at different places. Um, but yeah, this whole thing is just like adds the legend to the plot, basically. Um, and in between step eleven to fifteen, it's just like tweaking some parts of the legend. But then step eleven is where the legend is defined first defined. Um, yeah. So by step sixteen is when you see a plot with the legend. And this already has a lot of work done. Um, and I wrote a little bit more about how we get to guides. Um, I won't go into the details, it's here, but I just wanna like go over this point that um, the guides func or the, the information about guides is stored in scales. Um, and this was at first like very surprising to me. Uh, like guides seems like, you know, a very like, like you know, um, auxiliary or like peripheral, like aesthetic thing that like you kind of latch on, like, you know, slap onto the plot just to make it easier for the readers. Like how, it, how are guys related to scales? Um, and it took me a while for it to click, but the first thing that really helped me is thinking about guides as not just about things like color um, or other like non-positional aesthetics uh, or like color or size or fill, uh, but also about uh, axes. So if you think about it, um, the relationship between scales and guides um, is that the scale translates the underlying data. So for example, here, the data for the Y goes from 10 to 50, transforms 10 to 50 
to zero to one, which is like the, the coordinate space that the grid system works with. Um, and then and then the guys actually just reverses that transformation. Um, and so you take this space and then you you get to derive like if I point here using the axis guide, you can be like, oh, this position means this value. And then the scales are like this value means this position. Um, but they're like kind of it's kind of hard to see that there are two sides of the same coin because they're for different uses. Like the scale is for ggplot when it goes to plot things, plot data. Um, and then the guys are for the reader to, you know, think about what a position means in terms of the data. So it's like a transformation between space, some space to data. The space can be like positional x, y coordinate space. It could also be like a color space. Um, that's like what we perceive and then the data is what it represents. And then the scales get you from one direction, the guys get you to the other direction. Um, and this is actually reflected in the ggplot code, although um, I don't see a lot of ggplot code written this way, but I'm, I've been making a habit of doing this, um, which is like you, you specify guides inside the guide argument of scale functions. All scale functions, including like scale x, whatever, scale y, whatever, have a guide argument where you can specify what kind of guide that you want to use for the plot. Um, by default, the positional aesthetics use this guide called guide axis. So scale x continuous, scale y continuous use guide axis. Um, and then non-positional aesthetics or scales like color, fill, whatever, um, use guide legend by default. So we didn't have, like, we didn't specify the legend for color in our original plot, but we can make this explicit by adding scale color discrete guide equals guide legend. Uh, and this is just spelling out the defaults for you. And this looks exactly the same. Um, and then I also wrote some details about how guides are built. Um, but basically, guides are built in two steps, much like how layers are drawn. So guides undergo this first step, which is uh, you know, grabbing the underlying data that represents the guides. So here we have like three, what we call keys, three keys, like red, green, blue, with like dot and a you know, line through the middle. Uh, and then the, the labels, which are four, F and R, that actually has an underlying data frame representation, which is calculated internally at some point. Um, and, and that some point is this, this method called guide train, but the details are here. But basically the, that first step is getting this data frame representation of the legend. And then the next step is drawing the legend. Um, and so it works very similarly to layers. So it's like the internals does like stat and geom step for the layers. And then it does like almost like stat and geom step for the legend. And then it mushes them together. Um, and that's you know where most of ggplot um, happens. So that's legend. And then again, like the rest of the code. So I think in the source code, um, if I can open this fast enough, um, this is um, inside ggplot's GitHub. There's a file called plotbuild.r where it defines ggplotbuild and ggplotg table. ggplotg table is here. Um, the like up to here is where we get our first plot table. So this is our ggplot minus like title subtitle um, legend. This is like the, the data that's drawn plus facets plus like scales. Um, so the first like eight lines, I guess, does this. And then the next like, you know, a couple dozen lines do the legend. And then after that, all of this is like the adornment, right? So this is like 150 lines of if else statements. <laughs> um, that's like, you know, what, what most of this, the, the GIF was showing. It's like step 916, you got the plot and legend. Everything after that is just adding, you know, kind of trivial elements to the plot uh, with a bunch of, you know, unfamiliar but very low level and actually pretty simple uh, functions from the grid package and the G table package. Um, and so the book also doesn't really talk about it because I think it's, it's not worth our time. Uh, but yeah, but the output again is basically just this. It's the you grab the ggplot object, which is the, the thing that you make 
with user facing code that's like the you know ggplot plus like geom whatever plus that whatever the output of the ggplot code that you write is the ggplot object and then everything that happens after is like the internal so the first thing that happens is you run the ggplot build function on the ggplot object and then the output of that is passed to ggplot gtable you create a blank canvas and then you draw the gt and then you get the plot and so this is um the, the internals this is everything that happens in the internals a lot of steps are actually uh kind of compact in the internals uh like the stat and geom stage like the geom stage was just one line basically in um in an earlier step of g table but that's what the next chapter is for uh but yeah so that's like internals so that was the g table step um any thoughts questions <laughs> June, I'm in the middle of writing on Slack uh, uh, the direct message to you, and I'll I'll, I'll finish that in a oh, moment. Oh yes, but yes. <laughs> just watching your presentation, one of the things that that I'm completely fascinated by, or watching your, uh, it, it, it's not degradation, delineation, distilling. You're you're pulling apart the functions that make up some of these these. Uh, uh, lines of quick text right so you're calling on the ggplot library you want to you know generate this grob etc cetera, etc cetera. and these these few lines have a huge quantity of sub elements that are happening and i know the chapter is about ggplot internals my curiosity to you or to to anybody watching this in the future objects like class objects or uh, the the functions class the functions body uh are those what are those defined as and do we have a reference to research more into what you can do um, so as an example one of the things that i'm just completely fascinated by is you were using the body function to call out the actual code that does something right um yes. now a a person that's going in and researching this can go to the the github and you know for the for the package and try to figure out where exactly that exists or from the console they can just call on this point and have it pull up the function for visibility viewing mm -hmm. um what are the what are the common ones that you access the most when you are in the midst of doing your development work uh, and i'm asking this for a personal reason but also for anybody else that may be also uh having the same curiosity yes um that is a very good question and i guess i wonder Federica being an advanced star, you've talked about this, but um, there's a, so actually a lot of the, you know, what, what really got, so I, I've tried to write extensions before, like maybe two years ago, I like completely failed. Um, and so I was like, I need to sit down and understand the internals. One of the things, one of the things that really helped me was being like going through advanced R before I like jumped in. So actually advanced R has this chapter called functions. Um, and to answer your question more directly, the really relevant ones are body, which is, it, it's, it's actually right here in function fundamentals. So formals, body, and not so much environment, but formals is like, gives you the arguments that the function uses and body gives you the, the source code, like the body of the code. And the really nice thing is like, you know, let's take a really simple function as an example. This is the replace function. If it loads, it, you know, it, it, it takes a vector a list of indices and values you want to replace it with, it runs this code, which is pretty simple. Um, if you run formals on this function, you will get the arguments as a list. And then if you call uh, body on this function, you will get the function body, but it's essentially a list. And then you can coerce it as a list with as that list. And so then it will reveal to you the different steps. And this is like, you know, what I what I call steps like these. Uh, you know, single singular pieces of, of code that's run at once um, inside a function. And then if you want to like point out like, oh, this is a step where it does this thing of like, you know, subsetting and assigning, um, you can be like as that list body two, or because body is just like an essentially a list, but prints differently, you can also just do it directly. Um, and this is also again, like in advanced R. Um, okay. This is yeah. That that helpful. definitely answers. So I'll I'll definitely spend some time with that. And, and Frederica, you are uh, uh, facilitating that particular book, and that's that's an area that I've 
definitely missed out on uh, as of late. But um, I'll, I'll 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 research a little bit more about this. The there was a question that was asked during another book club regarding JavaScript and Shiny apps, and then how it manages that that media, right? And and we can use ggplot in Shiny apps on a web page, you know, generating out JavaScript, et cetera. But the question was more like, what is that storage element? Like, wh where does that get stored at? And it also relates to Ryan, the other Ryan that's in our same book club. He had posted something on Slack regarding large data sets. How do you manage large data sets inside, you know, a Shiny app or inside this JavaScript or anything else? And so I'm having a difficulty vocalizing exactly what you're doing. I don't want to just say it's memory. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's mm -hmm. obvious, but where does that memory live and how does that memory get managed and how does it, you know, process that data into something of visualization? So anyway, it's uh, it all kind okay. of, it all wraps around the same question, I guess. And so I, it, it, it is a selfish reason I'm asking this question. So, oh, yeah. So this is more broadly about just like, yeah, the things I know about GG. <laughs> right. I, I, okay. Yeah. Um, Maybe, maybe I can get back to you with a message on that because I also don't you really know. I need to think about how that works in my All right. Uh, <laughs> good, good. Go ahead, Friedrich. I also have a question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically this, this way I can access to a part of a plot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can use it. Like the same as you did, can you go to the, the legend uh, bit? Um, yes, like this. Where's the eh, that, that that's the bit. So I can use this legend, for example, and attach it to another plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Let me. So let me see. I I don't know if I can demo it now, but but yeah, keep going. I'm just gonna play around. No, that, that's my question. Uh, how can I use it? So, so basically, how can I manage uh, this uh, view? Um, uh, it, what what sort of class is that? It's a it's a it's a it's a ggplot part. So, it what, is, what is so basically, like inside ggplot internals, you're gonna see like a lot of different classes floating around. But basically, anything that has a class of grub behaves similarly. So these are all subject to that are all governed by the kind of functions that, you know, draw things like from grid. So, um, so this is like my plot P. Um, and like I said, like, GG plots are drawn and like rendered as a side effect, because if you look at the print dot GG plot method defined inside the GG plot two package, it you know, takes the ggplot as an input, like the print function, and then returns ggplot in, in like invisibly. But then to force it as a grub, there's a function called ggplot grub, which essentially just calls ggplot build and then the output of ggplot g table. So it gives you everything that you need to draw a plot, but doesn't plot it. And what this returns you is, uh, oops, is again a g table. And this is actually the same thing as the legend. So it's like kind of like the, the G table is what the GG plot is made of, but G table, the GG plot G table is also a nested G table. So there's elements of GG plot that's also a G table and legend box is one of them. And to your question about like what you can do with this legend box, you can do like, um, this requires you to know a little bit about the grid function, but you can you can like grid dot you can uh, like clear the page. You can grid dot draw the ggplot grub, which is essentially what the print function does. And then you can also draw the legend box, which will get printed in the middle, I guess. Yeah. Um, and if you wanted to combine them together, um, you can create a new grub that's like using this function called grub tree, uh, where it takes any number of 
drops key and then legend box and then this is a single grab graphical object that combines the ggplot grab and the legend grab um and you can do uh, like uh, yeah. obviously i get i can change the position oh and yeah set, of course uh, spe uh, um so you can change the position with the uh i guess like edit well actually like i don't even think we need to go into grobs let's just like try to make this work in patchwork because that should work um so let's let's just clear the plot so because this is like a a g table object and a grob um you should like it should work like you know it should work it will just give you a gg plot and then a legend in the middle, I guess, a oh, library patch for ggplot. Um, graph elements is a function from patchwork. That should make grobs compatible. Um, what is it? Yeah, there you go. Um, and then you know, we could do something like p plus uh, something inset, inset element. And then I guess we need to specify like left. Oh, this is a weird thing. Um, left bottom. Um, this will actually print, but this will print the plot and then instead the legend element as a part of the plot like here it takes up the bottom right corner um i see i see mm -hmm. and there's uh the background uh, and oh this is so. yeah oh that, that everything can customize um, uh, yeah legend background yeah. is a element so i think the legend box g table has a yeah. legend box background um, uh -huh. which you can change from theme um, and the way to get that is actually using the, the ggtrace function from uh -huh. the ggtrace package. Um, and this is actually, I think calplot has this functionality too. So, yeah, magic. I don't know what this means. Probably also calls ggplot gtable under the hood and then graphs it. Yeah. It grabs the G table. This is like ggplot grab. And then I guess it grabs part of the G table, like a row of the G table that matches a legend, and then grabs that legend and gives it to you. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's like this whole section on ggproto, which I guess is like. We, I guess we like kind of need to know it for the next section, but I like, in my opinion, like this is, this was the part of the chapter that I was really, really confused about the first time I read through the ggplot book. Um, and, and then like, you know, I, I was like developing ggtrace and I was writing extension stuff. And then I came back to this chapter and I realized I didn't need any of the information from this section of the chapter that's like introducing ggproto. Um, and maybe part of it is because I just like pick things up from like reading the source code and whatnot. But really, I think what you need to know about ggproto is like neither the gg part nor the proto part. Like if you distill it down to the very, very basics, ggproto objects are basically lists and what they call ggproto methods are functions that live inside lists. So here we have like two, let's call them like pseudo ggproto objects. We call it string and number. Um, string is a list of three elements, add, subtract, and show. And these are functions. These are just anonymous functions. Like take these all take two arguments and then they add, subtract, and show according to how a string should behave. And then I define another object called number it's again a list of the same you know elements add subtract and show except add and subtract are now arithmetic operations and then show j 
just inherits from the string object. So show is the, the function that string show use, which is this function. You just kind of copied it over here by grabbing the show element of the string object, which is again, a function. So these are just list of functions. And I think that's really all you need to know to work with ggproto objects. Um, and, and then this small part here is, is the inheritance. And that's actually how things are used inside um, ggproto objects. They borrow from other ggproto objects. So in fact, if you see like G on box plot um, has a draw group method, which calls geom segment draw panel, geom crossbar draw, and then, you know, I think this one is just like a point scroll. But, you know, like we talked about how box plot have different components and actually just calls different geoms and then adds them up together using the same grop tree function that I just showed you earlier to combine the plot with the legend. Um, so yeah, so this is like pretty much I think all you need to know to get started on ggproto objects at least. And then, you know, these behave like functions. Uh, so minus this like odd syntax where these functions live inside of lists, not in the global environment. So you always have to subset ggproto objects as you call these functions. So like string add a, b just concatenates them, string subtract, um, you know, does like a string remove. Um, string show just combines the inputs and then you know puts and between them, um, and then numbers add you know adds the numbers subtracts the numbers and then show behaves the same as string show and so it just prints the two numbers uh, joins them by and um, and this is like kind of how how ggproto um, methods and ggproto inheritance works um, inheritance actually is like a little bit trickier but i think the really the only thing you need to know about the syntax other than this part which is again just here but a little bit more complicated i think because it uses a bunch of like self things um which actually doesn't have like show up that often in the code but basically self is just a reference to the same object it's kind of complicated in the abstract, but um, but yeah, that's like this is basically how ggproto works. Um, and there's some code. What here. what ggproto means? Oh, so ggproto is again. So basically, the the idea here is um, there's I talked about how you need like you know in the internals we namely have two different steps, which is like the stat step which calculates the summary statistics. And then this geom step that takes the summary statistics and then grabs parts of it and then distributes them across the things, the individual things that you're drawing. Um, but actually this oversimplifies the process because there's actually, there's not like a single stat function and a single geom function. Um, it's actually bad if that were the case because you'd be repeating a lot of things between different geoms um, and different stats. So what actually happens is, the, the things that you need to do to complete this stat stage and the geom stage are broken apart into multiple different functions. Um, and in, in practice, this looks like this. So geom box plot is again, kind of like a list and it has a bunch of different things, like a bunch of different functions, methods. Um, and so the, the things that needs to happen for this step is like all of this plus like some other things that it, it that it inherits from its parent but basically basically just know that there's a lot of different things that happen inside of geom and stat stages and but those different steps share some similarities when you're doing a particular thing like like for a geom box plot um geom box plot does very specific things when it goes to um, you know, uh, determine whether you have all the correct aesthetics. Um, and then there's this other step inside the geom where you're like actually drawing things. There's also another step where you're, you know, checking for this other thing. And these are all kind of coherent set that's like box plus specific kind of functions related to geoms. And that's why this list analogy makes a lot of sense. So this is like 
geom box plot is a list of function that's relevant for box plots um, in the geom stage. Uh, stat box plot are a, is a list of functions that's relevant for the stat stage of the the, the internals. Um, and so that's like a ggproto. ggproto objects are just list of functions, sometimes properties uh, that are not functions, but yeah, these are these are what power um, the internals. Yeah, maybe. I like had some concrete examples from my talk. Um, if you want to look through this, this is also, I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, this is a presentation I gave, and I think the talk should be up here next month. Um, but yeah, so you know, like, for example, um, like stat box plot compute group is a function that is specific to stat box plot that you know calculates the the data that you need to draw each box plot and so this is like this compute group method of the stat box plot ggproto is the function that calculates these internal summary statistics uh, like where like what are the outliers and um, you know, how far do the whiskers extend and what are the, you know, quartiles and what's the median and stuff like that. Um, and then I don't know if I have a lot of stuff for the geom stuff, but yeah, geoms are things that return you drops, individual drops. Um, I guess I didn't print one here, but yeah. So that's, it's like, it, it breaks down a lot of steps. That's what the ggproto methods do. I think we'll, we'll see it more next chapter. This chapter was kind of like, like advanced R style introduction of ggproto. It was like, it's, it's, it basically looks like, it looks like the R6 chapter of advanced R because that's actually the, the closest object oriented system to ggproto. We'll actually see that it, Looks pretty similar. Um, okay. next, next chapter is a bit, uh, for me at least, is a bit like an introduction to to this GG proto. Yeah, so yeah. You can investigate and see if you can change uh, our, where, where are the parts that you can uh, identify. Uh, the, the changes that you want to make. But what I didn't understand, to be honest, is how I can change. So, for example, in if I uh, want to modify a team, I use the team function, okay? Mm -hmm. So I can make a modification with a team function. But if, if I want to make a modification to a scale, to build up a different scale, just as the same as scale, color, this uh, something like that. So I need to change inside the scale continuous, for example. And how do I do that? How would I do that, basically? So I, how can I, so that, that's why, so uh, the steps are clear. So where they act, so where do, where do you find these pieces? that you might want to change, this is absolutely clear. But then, um, so I didn't, mm, there is no clear um, step uh, um, explanation to see how materially can, you can finally uh, make the change and they show up like an example with scale continuous and scale verities, so you can see the difference and where the change happened. But then, effectively, how that happened. So, how you make this change? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that so is. This is the, 
the hard part. Yeah, finding the right <laughs> extension point, right? Um, yeah. I will. I will say. Um, let's see. Um, Gina Reynolds, who like created the flipbook R package that does like incremental reveals of like ggplot code and other types of code. Um, she's been working on like kind of like easier examples um, of like extending ggplot that I think is a little bit more accessible than the book because the book kind of like throws a lot at you in a single chapter. So I'm I'm dropping one of the the things here um if you want to take a look but yeah what you're asking is like what what steps do i need to change to make like an actual ggplot extension like make it behave differently um and i don't know that that's kind of hard like i don't i think the book makes it hard but i also don't see like a lot of different alternatives um i think it requires you to you know, dig in and then just see like what things happen where, and then um, try to track down the geom or stat that made that happen. Um, because the geoms and stat stats are really the 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 most frequent and the most viable extension points. So once you narrow it down to like something about the geom and stat that you want to change, then it's a matter of um there might be an example here maybe not it's a matter of um for example this is from gina reynolds like internals cookbook um of like defining a, a function that like that's kind of like you want to do something differently at a certain step, you kind of wrap it as a function first, that's like a standalone function. And then you replace the method with that, that function that you just defined. I mean, that's like that's the cleanest okay, way thanks. to do it. Yeah. So like the, the two components of ggproto um, that you always need is like, what is what is the class? So this is like stat box plot, like geom point. Um, this one here is called stat row number. It inherits from a stat or another child of stat. In this case, it inherits from stat, um, which you can see if you call class on a ggproto method, you can see the inheritance chain. So this is a geom box plot that inherits from geom. Um, and I think like geom, like error bar inherits from more comp, no, this also inherits from geom. I think it's like, some extension packages have very complicated inheritance. Geom arc or from G2 force inherits from geom shape, which in turn inherits from geom polygon, which in turn inherits from geom. And so if you were writing geom arc bar, then you would you know, pass in geom shape as inherit. Uh, but most of the times you're just inheriting directly from stat um, or geom, which is like the top level GG protos. Um, and you override some parts of it. You don't need to write it from scratch. You you look at ggplot stat. You see what parts of it you want to change. You want to change the behavior of compute group, um, and you want to change um, the the required aesthetics, like the aesthetics that the stat needs to compute the kind of information you want it to compute. Um, and so, if you only give it x, then it's gonna this this stat is gonna throw an error. Um, and then once you define a, a ggproto object. Then you create a wrapper function, which looks like this, uh, which basically just collects all the arguments that you need to later pass down into the layer function. Um, and so this is like what all the geom underscore stat underscore functions look like under the hood. They are functions that take a bunch of different arguments. And you know they maybe do some stuff afterwards that just like cleans up the input, but then critically they just end up calling the layer function with 
the they just like pass down everything that they received into the layer function um and then this function can now be used with like the plus operator and then uh, add layers and that's how you go from that's how you go from like function to ggproto object to a layer function that you can actually use as like users of ggplot when you're writing ggplot code yeah i don't know when they introduced that actually that might be in the case study check yeah if you also if you've not seen thomas and peterson's like r studio talk like two years ago that one i think is also helpful um as you're doing chapter 21. do you have the, which one do you have the link uh, I for found that? It. yes i found it it's called extending your ability to extend gg which kind of walks through this kind of recipe of starting with what you want to change about how a stat or geom currently runs finding the method of that stat or geom object that does it and then replace and then like creating you know a, a child that's kind of like a copy and then overriding parts of the um that geom or stat in the process. Uh, so this talk is really good. Thank you. Other thoughts should we? You feel ready for next chapter? There you go. It's a big <laughs> yeah, chapter. Be better. It yeah, be better. Kind of scary. <laughs> you and I. June, I had a, a thought as we were going through all of this, and, and it goes back to a, a previous comment we were discussing about the XY coordinates of zero to one and taking the the uh, uh, canvas, we'll call it, right? The, the space in which you're drawing the plot, what are the dimensions of that canvas? Uh, not the scale, not the, not the, uh, the uh, generated output, but the zero to one and then how that relates. I'm curious, depending on the device that you're rendering the plot on, right? So again, I'm, I'm, I'm in this, M shiny mindset, this mastering shiny mindset. So I'm creating a shiny app. I've got a, a graphical object and I'm wanting to render it uh, through shiny IO or, or shiny apps IO, um, giving it a dimensional value. That canvas, that space on the web page is going to be dynamic dependent on the user that's viewing that ggplot. So I guess my question would be is there a point where a data uh, a scale size the dimensions of the viewer screen is passed back to the server that populates a variable that is used to generate the scale meaning that it's dynamic you're you're there's going to be some level of input to that function mm -hmm. that allows you to draw on the space and a good example of actually doing this while you're presenting right now would be if you were to change your browser scale or browser size you're going to see that the the rendered plots that you have would also scale as well. Um, do you have any yes. thoughts in that regard? Uh, good point. So um, there's before that there's two actually two different ways ways in which a plot after you render it like saved to a PNG file can look different in size from the reader's perspective. One is like this this thing that I'm doing here, zoom in and out. This is actually independent of what the size of the plot is defined in pixels or percentages. So if you look at this image, it has a width of 672 pixels. This doesn't change while I do this, but then its size can also change if I change the width property directly, like set it to 1072. Kind of jumped up a bit. That's not very clear. Let's say two. That's two pixels because I'll set the image. Anyways, it was originally like, what was it? All right. 672. And then it could be. 10 seconds. You know, that's one way that it can change. That's another way it can change. I'll say it's kind of harder to detect or like listen to this kind of like change in size events, but 
like in so far as like I think there's there's this um property of the window object which represents the browser window called inner height and inner width which gives you the pixels um of the the, the browser that's like viewing this this web page um and this doesn't tell you like in inches what it is that the reader sees because you know different screens have different resolutions um so this would look very big on a TV, but probably not on a laptop because laptops have higher resolution. Um, but this can at least tell you, um, I think this might be sensitive to, yeah. So I like zoomed in. Now the, the amount of pixels that I can see within my zoomed in window are smaller than what it was when I zoomed out. So it was you know, at 100%, at I was at you know, 1641. If I zoom in like 500%, um, I'm at 320. And I think you can do like, you know, add event listener. Is it window.add event listener? I'm not exactly sure, but there's like this in vanilla JavaScript, there's an add event listener function. Well, and uh, I'm 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 posing this as a as a topic of discussion in the reference to raster images versus vector images. Oh, so yeah. like a PNG obviously is a static value. There's no manipulation with it. It's just the object is the object and it just puts it on the screen based on size. If it's a vector object though, now it does have the dynamic ability of manipulating based on the, the viewing window or the viewing size that you're dealing with. And so ggplot does have that vector element output possibility. Um, maybe I'm, I'm, I don't want to confuse something. I, I got off on a tangent. Frederick is familiar with a, a subject I've been working on as of late with images in general. And so a raster image uh, at 300 you know, DPI is used for print output, but in a web framework, you want it to only be like 72 DPI. That DPI is kind of that ratio of canvas, right? Um, how much information can I provide in that particular uh, point if I do a lossless conversion from you know what it was into a different different resolution I'm going to lose information it's going to try to do a, a lossless conversion from bitmap to to png or from jpeg to png you understand all the the color code references of of that manipulation that lossless conversion pixel conversion as we discuss that topic into the the subject of the entire rendering engine that is ggplot um how do those coordinate systems play into the uh, scale, the, the the transition from the zero to one, or, sorry, from what you have into the zero to one, uh, and then back the other direction. So the pixel on the screen as it's drawn in that place. So uh, just as an example, um, we'll take the third uh, dot on the, the left side of your image, the one closest to the 40 uh, hyphen. So that placement on that graphical object, right? We know that the scalar is gonna be zero to one. And then as it's rendered based on the scale from zero to whatever 50, um, that's the place on the screen. Um, that can change uh, dependent on the viewing window that it is populating. I'm gonna stop because I, I know I'm-, I'm... I, I think I know, I, I understand what you're getting at. Um, yeah. and... And that, that is a really good question because this is also one of the things that I didn't actually realize about um, how ggplot works. But as you say, there are things that are drawn in like this zero to one coordinate space. Yes. Um, and those ones, the, the, the things that are drawn in that coordinate space, their, their relative positions are preserved. So no matter how much I stretch or shrink this plot, like this point is going to be, you know, relatively like high and relatively left. And that kind of ratio is going to be kept the same. You can still read the guides, the axes, labels, and tick marks, and then recover that information. You'll be very accurate in it. There are some parts of the plot where this does not apply to. So uh, we can actually, you know, make like a dynamic, um, you know, dynamic canvas by, you know, doing the, clicking the zoom button here. Um, if I, if I stretch out this plot, it has that same kind of high level information about like where are the points in the zero to one coordinate space, um, but this is this is going to adjust it a bit and fix itself. Yeah, 
and then you know this this is still you know like in the right left the the things that it doesn't preserve though are actually legends which are drawn in absolute units um and so if i keep stretching this this way like towards the bottom right you're gonna see these lines stretch out but these lines will stay the same size so the lines inside the legend is going to be the same size as down here but these lines are you know stretched out um and this is because whenever you're stretching plots you kind of want that to apply to the panels but not really the legend so this is kind of built into ggplot that legends are drawn in absolute space another thing that you'll notice is things like text have a fixed position but these have absolute sizes like points um so text you know like the by default i think has like 12 points or something like that and so down here um has a shorter width than this this pop-up uh but you'll see that the text of the title extends a little bit further than middle of the panel um but then in here um the text of the title extends a little bit less than the middle of the panel um and so if you want the text to stretch then you need to listen to these kinds of stretching events and then appropriately kind of resize the, the underlying, you know, the value of the size for the text. And this, this actually can be handled inside grid. Um, and this is a very important topic, I guess, in, in just ggplot in general, like the, the, the undertoning or underlying engine that, that generates a lot of the, the mechanisms here. I'm, I'm hoping to extend the conversation uh, uh, into uh, into other areas, but um, not provide any confusion to others uh, maybe watching later on, I guess. Yeah, I'll, I'll write some stuff up in the in the Slack because I, I know exactly what you're talking about and I had this difficulty and it's a very, very good question, important issue. Um, and I have some things that might be relevant. Is it? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for letting me rant again. Oh. Bye. We're meeting next week. Yeah. Next all week. Right. Chapter twenty-one. <laughs> See you all next Bye. week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.